Good evening, good evening, Fresh Start Church, family and friends. Thank you for joining us tonight for Bible study. I'm Minister Eileen at Fresh Start Church here, and I've been given the opportunity by my pastor, Gregory Cannon Jr., and my first lady, Sharonda Cannon, to uh, teach this Bible study tonight. So I'm really excited about that. Um, before we get into it, I just want to invite all of you, all of our online participants here this evening, to like, share, and comment on this broadcast. Um, we are excited to be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was the commission given to the church by Jesus. And so we're excited to be doing that. And when you share, like, and comment on social media, it engages the algorithms of that technology, and it helps us to better fulfill the gospel commission. So thank you for doing that. Um, I like how the camera is close up to me because I know I'm coming into your homes tonight. So thank you for inviting me to be present with you to study God's word. All right, we're going to open with prayer, then we're going to get right into this topic. Oh, so Lord God Almighty, we just come before you this evening with praise, thanks, and gratitude, God, expecting your goodness, Lord, looking for it, believing in it, trusting and seeking it, oh God, thanking you, God, for all that you are that is good, we say thank you. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your word, the Holy Bible. I ask, oh God, that you would allow your voice to speak as we read these scriptures, speak to our hearts, teach us about your word, Lord, so that we can better carry forward the commission given to us corporately and individually. And we say thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Pastor Gregory Cannon has been teaching us in church, he's been speaking on a topic about being connected, being connected to God connected to the body of Christ and what that means and the benefits of that. And in my personal study, as I was digging into that, one of the things that came to me was that the goodness and the glory of God is the solution to everything. And that when we are connected to God, we have access to what he is, which is good. Sometimes we hear that saying, this is God is good all the time. But I wonder how many of us really believe and expect God to be good for us all the time. So I have 10 miracles that we can expect when we are connected and believing in the goodness of God. And I'm going to dig right into these. The first one is the goodness of God explains everything. Have you ever been in a situation where you were looking for an explanation? I'm going to go to scripture, Psalm uh, chapter 33, verse 5 for this um, particular principle or miracle. But the goodness of God explains everything. And what that means is that even if we are facing difficult situations and we don't know why, they don't make a lot of sense, we have a God whose goodness can explain that to us. Uh, again, Psalm chapter 33, verse 5. I'm going to turn to it here. And we're going to put it up on the monitor, on the screen for you all. Psalm chapter 33, verse 5, and it reads, He loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of God. Also, Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 21 gives us a story about Joseph. And while we're getting there, I just want to make note that in that verse we just read in Psalms, that the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of God's goodness. And yet so often we are focused on things that are not good. So yes, there is a lot in the world that is bad, but the earth is filled with the goodness of God. He's created it that way. He, he covers it with himself. And if we're looking for him, seeking him, we will experience that goodness, even when things don't make sense. 
In Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 21, I'm just going to read you kind of the end of the story with Joseph. And this is the, Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Israel, and he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Their intention was originally to kill him. Now, mind you, Israel, or Jacob, was a wealthy man. And so he had a family business. His sons, even into their adulthood, like as was the custom of that day, were able to work in the family business and inherit all of the wealth and the prosperity of their father, Jacob. So it, it probably didn't make a lot of sense to Joseph when he found himself thrown into a well, beaten by his brothers, and then sold into slavery and being taken into another country. He was in slavery there, sold into it when he was 17 years old, so not able to grow up in his father's business, but rather having to be afflicted with slavery and all manner of hardship and prison. But at the end of the story, when he revealed who he was, the goodness of God explained everything because there was a reason why he had gone through everything that he went through. So Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 is where we'll begin. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require, requite us all the evil which we did to him. They, he, they thought he would pay them back. Verse 16, and they sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, and I pray thee now, the trespass of your brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake to him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. They said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said to them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. For am I in the place of God? So he said, Why are you afraid of me? Verse 20 is the key here. He said, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And there in that verse is how God's goodness explained it. Everything that Joseph had been through, all the evil that his brothers had done to him that led to his 17 or so years in enslavement and in a foreign land, God meant it for good. God's goodness explains everything. When we focus on it and we look for the effects and with our heart and our soul, we are able to see how he gives explanation through his goodness. The second miracle that we can expect from God's goodness is that the goodness of God surrounds everything. In Psalm 23, we read in verse 6 that goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. So not only does God's goodness surround all things, but it actually pursues us. It follows us. If you'll turn with me to Psalm chapter 5, verse 12, we learn how God's goodness surrounds and protects us. Psalms chapter 5, verse 12. So we're studying the word here. God's goodness will protect us. Not only does it surround us, it pursues us, it follows us, and it protects us. And we can read... For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, will thou compass him as with a shield. God's goodness favors us, blesses us, and it surrounds us with protection. Miracle number three, the goodness of God. When we're connected to God and we can experience what he is, is good. The goodness of God frees us from everything. It frees us from anxiety. It frees us from fear. It frees us from overwhelm. Psalm chapter 27, verse 13 and 14 tells us how when we do believe that we are going to see God's goodness, that it frees us from anything, including mental unhealth. But there is the key there. Again, our action step is that we believe. What King David said in Psalm 
chapter 27, verse 13 through 14. I'm going to turn there. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. King David knew that he was going through some treacherous times, and he was experiencing the Bible um, gives us indication that King David suffered from some of the times anxiety, depression even. But he believed, even in the midst of that, that he was going to see the goodness of God. And that, that belief is what freed him. He said, I would have been lost. I would have fallen into despair. I would have fainted or not been able to function. But I believed that I would see God. I would, I would see his goodness. And because of that belief, he was freed from that despair. Miracle number four, the goodness of God satisfies everything. We don't have to convince God to be good to us. Psalm chapter 145, verse 14 through 16, explains to us how God's desire is to bless us. His desire is to satisfy us. And we're going to read that together now, Psalm 145, verse 14 and 16. He opens his hand willingly to us. We don't have to pry it open when God is for us, when we are connected to his goodness. Psalm chapter 145, verse 14 through 16, and it reads, The Lord upholds all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Chapter number, uh, verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. And verse 16. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. I'm going to read that verse again. Thou openest thy hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Thing. The goodness of God satisfies everything. Do you believe that? When you are dealing with the unsatisfactory situation, maybe you are experiencing something that is um, a hardship even, do you really believe that there's goodness from God for you in that situation? That's important for us to believe. Just like King David said in the prior verse, he said, I believe that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We don't have to pry God's hand open. He opens it willingly to us. He is willing, it is his will to satisfy our desire and the desire of every living thing. In the New Testament, in the book of Luke, chapter 12, Verse 22 through 35, but the focus verse I'm going to look at is verse 32. We learn there that it is our Father's good pleasure to give us his kingdom. This is in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 32. You see, God's desire is for us. And he wants to see us successful. He doesn't want to see us suffering we don't have to beg and plead him, although sometimes that's what is necessary to correct our character, but that's not for him. He doesn't require that of us. He actually desires to give us goodness. Luke chapter 12, verse 22, verse 32, I'm sorry. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Those are the words of Jesus Christ, and he's telling us, don't be afraid of the things that you may be facing. Not only does God open his hand to us, but it is his pleasure to give us the kingdom. It's our responsibility to learn what it means to expect that, to seek it, and to look for it from God. Miracle number five. The goodness of God changes everything. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, this is amazing. It's not how sorry we are or how smart we are that changes things in our lives. 
It's not even how holy we are that leads us to repentance and changes us in our hearts. It's how good God is. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 shows, tells us this. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Rome where he's telling them what God's goodness can do for them, what the righteousness and goodness of God will do, not by their actions. And many people feel downtrodden. They feel hopeless because we feel like we can't get it right. Like if we, if, man, if I had only d done that differently or handled that differently, then I would have been able to perform well enough to satisfy God, well enough to bring about a change. If I was only good enough or righteous enough, then I would have been repentant and things might have been different. But it's not our goodness or our willpower that brings us into repentance. It's God's goodness. So I'm going to read here from Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, For despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance? And long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. So we don't have to suffer with our riches. We're, suffer we're knowing that God's goodness, it is his goodness that leads us to repentance. It's his goodness even that allows us to be repentant. As sinners, we've all fallen short of God's glory. But he draws us back to him in his goodness. He draws us to himself. He causes us to change. The goodness of God changes everything. The sixth miracle that you can expect when you're connected to God and his goodness is that the goodness of God shapes everything. Romans 8.28, this is one of my favorite memory verses in the Bible. And it is something that I thought about when I look at the season that we're in, a season coming just on this side of um, a global pandemic, still dealing with the outcome of that, even looking at the end time age and what we're dealing with in the world, many people trying to figure out how to get their lives back together, how to make ends meet, how to even make sense of what's happening but God is trying to move our lives to something so much better. He's actually using all of these things and shaping them together. Now, God doesn't cause diseases. He didn't cause a pandemic. He doesn't cause tragedy and loss or trauma. But he does cause those things to be shaped into something good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is one of the familiar verses that tells us, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now that says all things, not some things, not the things that seem favorable to us or, wow, boy, I was lucky that day, everything fell into place for me. But God says all the things work together for our good. All the things, like Joseph said, you, what you meant for evil, brothers, God intended it for good. When they, they, saw, they threw him into slavery, now, at that time, I'm sure Joseph didn't think that that was something good, but he told them that at the end of the story, that you meant selling me into slavery for evil, God intended it for good. God shapes everything into good. There's a quote from um, a, an evangelist, Gregory DeKau, and he said it like this, and I quote, God can take the good and the bad. He can take the sour and the sweet. And through the chemistry of the cross, he causes these things to result in something good. He's not just the author of our faith. He is the finisher, too. And so not only did he write the story of our faith, but he intends to bring it to pass. He intends to shape all the parts of our lives into something good, working it all together for our good. That's the goodness of God. The goodness of God shapes everything. Miracle number seven, the goodness of God uses everything. 
the goodness of God uses everything. So every hardship, every difficult season, everything that seems impossible to bear today, God's goodness will use all of those things. He uses everything. He's using this Bible study. He's using technology. There are some people that have thought over the years that technology was evil. And I can tell you right now that the ruler of the age would intend to use technology for evil. He would intend to use it to have us addicted to screen time, addicted to online gambling sites, addicted to video games. But God will use that for good. He uses everything. He's using that same technology that some use to entrap us to spread the gospel tonight through this Bible study. Sometimes it doesn't make sense at the moment, but our job is to trust the goodness of God. Our job is to believe that we will see God's goodness in the land of the living. God's goodness, the goodness of God, he uses everything. Miracle number eight, the goodness of God restores everything. We're going to look at the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 25. Joel 2, verse 25. You see, God restores everything. He turns death into life. He turns sin into righteousness. He turned the Red Sea into dry land, famine into bread from heaven called manna. He turned sorrow into joy and grief into dancing. He turned two fish and five loaves into a buffet to feed more than 5,000 people. The 5,000 were just the men that were counted, not including the women and children. God restores everything. Jesus Christ turns it around and makes what little bit we have, even the nothingness we feel we have at times, into something miraculous and amazing. Joel chapter 2, verse 25, and it reads, And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. It. Do, do any of you feel like some years have been eaten, like some, some time has been lost? I've heard people say sometimes, well, that's 30 minutes, I'll never get back. I've heard some people say, well, that's seven years of my life, I'll never get back. That was a waste of time. But you know what? God said he was going to restore those things because the goodness of God restores everything. He turns things that were hopeless, desperate, and destitute into his goodness. The goodness of God restores everything. Miracle number nine, the goodness of God outlasts everything. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 40 for this this one of the miracles. And I just want to let you know while we're getting there to the verse that God's goodness will outlast this pandemic. It will outlast your debt. It will outlast your sickness, any pain that you are in. It will outlast every weapon formed against you. It will outlast everything in your past, in your present, and in your future. God's goodness outlasts everything. We cannot outdo him. We can't outgood him. We can't outsatisfy him. He desires to satisfy you and to bless you. He's for you. He just gives us some responsibilities in it, namely that we believe and look for his goodness, that we trust that even though we're going through this circumstance today, God is good and his goodness will outlast it. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 40. Okay, and it reads, let me get to it here. 
one moment. Here we go. Jeremiah 32, verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant. Everlasting. That means it will not end. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. That's the covenant. That's the promise. But I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. The fear of the Lord in our hearts is a reverence, an honor, a desire to be in relationship with him. So doesn't that sound familiar? A desire to be connected to him, to know him, to pursue him, and to obey him. If we are seeking God, and that's one of my favorite verses too, Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we're seeking him, then not only is everything going to fall into place, but we're going to be able to witness God outlasting that thing that was the hardship or the pain or the suffering, the disparaging. He is going to outlast it because he outlasts everything. His goodness never fails. It's an everlasting covenant or promise. And miracle number 10, this is my favorite, and I'm just going to run through these verses because I, I just kept finding them, verse after verse. Miracle number 10 is the goodness of God provides everything. There's a song that's out right now, the um, Elevation Music, the Maverick City, I think they're a part of that a collective that sang it too. It's called Jira, You Are Enough. And I will be content in every circumstance. You are Jira, Jehovah Jira, the provider. God's goodness provides everything. Make note of these for your own personal study. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. God gave his son to provide forgiveness of sin. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God's goodness gives us hope and a future. Matthew chapter 5, verse 40, 45. Chapter 5, verse 45, Matthew. God's goodness gives us rain and sun. He takes care of the elements so that we can live in this ecosystem called earth. James chapter 4, verse 6, God's goodness gives grace. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 through 31, he gives us strength. His goodness makes us strong. James chapter 1, verse 5, he gives wisdom. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, his goodness gives us faith. Acts chapter 3, verse 25, God gives blessing. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, he gives us power. And not only does he give us power, that particular verse, I love it because it says, God will give you power to create wealth. God gives you power. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10, God's goodness gives us rest. Anybody tired here tonight? Tired of the day in and the day out? God's goodness gives you rest, and it doesn't even look like rest. Some people will look at you some of the times. People look at me sometimes, and they say, man, you got a lot going on. I don't even know how I'm doing it because I feel tired. But God's goodness gives me a different kind of a rest. That's what God's goodness can do. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10. Psalm verse 136, Psalm verse 136 and 25, chapter 136 and 25, God's goodness gives us food and provision. He provides for our physical sustenance and our needs. Psalm chapter 127 and verse 12, he gives us rest. We heard that a, minute, a moment ago in Deuteronomy, but Psalm 127 verse 2, he gives us sleep. He gives us sleep. When we are reliant on him and we believe and we trust in his goodness, we can get a good night's sleep. We don't have to be fretful anxious and worried. Psalm chapter 18, verse 50, God's goodness brings deliverance. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, God's goodness brings the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, God's goodness brings the victory. The list goes on and on. We cannot out-provide or out-give the goodness of God, period. We can't outdo it. God's goodness, the goodness of God, provides everything. Jehovah Jireh, he is enough. And so we can be thankful to God 
and remember what our assignment is and the task. We don't, and receiving the goodness and staying connected. We don't have to pry God's hand open. What our part in the equation is, is to believe in his goodness, to trust his goodness, to look for his goodness, to expect his goodness, to ask him, make request of him for his goodness, to seek it and pursue it. So not only do we expect it and we look for it, but we're going to pursue and seek it, seek him first, seek his goodness. That's how we stay connected to it. And you can expect those miracles in your life, not because you're strong, not because you're wise, not because you're sorry or good, but because God is good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the study of your word. Thank you for your Bible, God. Thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. I just want to, as a matter of invitation to you, I want to let you all know about our members' fellowship. It is coming up on September 18th. We're super excited about it, and I want to extend a personal invitation to you because oftentimes we are working in the church or we're trying to get in and get out, do, you know, get our study in, at the word, hear the word of God, and get on with the rest of what life has to do, what we've got to do. But we really want to spend some time getting to know who you are, getting to know you, and just loving on you, learning your name, putting a face with the name. We want to do that. So if you would please take out your mobile device right now. If you are a member, we want to update your member information. If you're thinking of becoming a member, we would love to have you as a part of this fellowship. And we want you to text message the word member, M-E-M-B-E-R, to 734-875-8787 to make it official. On September 18th, we're having our members fellowship. We want you there. There's going to be food, fun, fellowship, and it is free. We really want you there. This coming Sunday, which is the 21st of August, we're celebrating Pastor's birthday here in the sanctuary. We would like you to be here. Both of these events are on August are in August. Oh no, the first one, the birthday is August the 21st. The other one is September 18th. I meant to say that they are both in the sanctuary at 623 Oak Street in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So until we see you at one of these events, God be with you. Believe, trust, seek, and expect his goodness in your life and share this broadcast with someone else. We also want to invite you if you were um, fed by this message tonight or are fed by this ministry spiritually, please consider paying your tithe and your offering to this ministry. You are sowing into good ground with Fresh Start Church. There are some instructions on the screen for you to tithe and offer here. Your gift is important. God tells us that if we give into his storehouse, which is his church, the body of Christ, to do his work, that he's going to give you a blessing. So if you would do that, I believe that you will experience the gift that he has promised in that giving. And I want to say thank you for it on behalf of my pastor, Gregory Cannon Jr., my first lady, Sharonda Cannon. You all have a blessed week filled with the goodness of God.